and uh, welcome everybody to our, our uh, two-year college Zoom meetups. Uh, today we've got James Freericks from uh, Georgetown, right? right? And I'll uh, leave it to him to introduce the topic and proceed at his own pace. Yes, all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, just to ground you, I prepared it like maybe a 25 minute, maybe 30 minute presentation because I wanted to make sure we had ample time to discuss things. And I also want to make it clear that uh, um, if I say something that's wrong about the way things are in two year colleges, it's not, it's simply because I don't know, because I've never taught at a two year college, but uh, I've been involved in uh, some projects for a number of years now of trying to bring quantum mechanics uh, to the general public. So I have a MOOC that is on edX that's called Quantum Mechanics for Everyone. And it's got four weeks worth of content and it teaches all about uh, superposition and uh, entanglement and complementarity and so forth. But it only uses high school level algebra. Um, nevertheless, the material that we cover is really quite high level. We cover non-demolition measurements, we cover Hangu Mandel experiment and uh, delayed choice experiments and so forth. So we cover a lot of very complicated material, uh, but all at a very accessible level in terms of the prerequisites. Um, and I've never actually met him, but now I've seen him sort of live. Uh, Mo Hasanovich contacted me was it a year ago, Mo? It was about a year ago, I think. It was about a year ago, yeah. Um, and he asked me to um, help uh, serve on an advisory board for a proposal he's putting in. He's at Indian uh, River State College in Florida. And he put in a proposal that's been funded on uh, training photonics engineers or technicians uh, in more quantum mechanics. Um, and I've recently put in a proposal to uh, to NSF, um, and uh, um, this is with uh, um, Leanne Dowdy, uh, who's also on the call here. And uh, one of the things we put in there was that uh, you know if this gets funded, we're going to try to take that edX course um, along with the junior level um, uh, undergraduate course that I also have that's uh, running right now on edX. And we're going to try to uh, find a way to um, take a subset of that material and make it, you know, accessible at the two-year college level. And when the AAPT meeting was this summer, I decided to come to the two-year college meetup because I wanted to meet people from two-year colleges to see if there was interest in it. And that's what led to this meeting. So I hope that what I present will be valuable to you. Um, but again, I... You know, if I'm missing something, I'm I'm here to be corrected. I'm not trying to shove any ideas down anyone's throat by any means. So, um, so I'll just uh, share the screen now and get started. And I hope everyone can see this. Um, I'll just encourage people to mute. Um, for some reason, I'm not getting myself on the speaker view, but. I guess that's okay. We'll just put that up there. Okay, so. And my thing is not working. I'm gonna do this. All right, good. All right, so um, we're in the middle of the second quantum revolution. I didn't really realize this, but it started around 1980 when people could make um, single quantum sources of light. And since then, people have been manipulating and working with individual quanta, uh, which is very different from what people were doing back in you know, the 1920s, where we were learning about quantum mechanics. But we were really working with more macroscopic collections of quantum objects, like metals and semiconductors and, and so forth. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually play for you a two-minute trailer for the course that I have on edX. And, um, and then I'll go on after that. But this gives you a sense of uh, the undergraduate course that I prepared. It's really focused on the second quantum revolution. Um, and in fact, 
Hold on. I just realized I didn't share by doing the thing. So let me share again. I forgot to click the include share sound. So none of you heard any of that. So let me start this again. My apologies. Hi, I'm Jim Freerix. I'm a professor of physics from Georgetown University, and I'm here to introduce you to an exciting new quantum mechanics course that's going to be offered on edX. The original developers of quantum mechanics focused on physical phenomena like the spectra of atoms. They developed a wave equation called the Schrodinger equation, and with that equation they were able to calculate the probability of electrons in atoms. This was the first quantum revolution, and it spanned from about 1920 to 1980. It led to marvelous technological developments, such as computers and lasers, and the standard model of particle physics, and much, much more. It was focused on understanding and applying quantum phenomena rather broadly. But now we can do much more. This is a scanning tunneling microscopy image of atoms on the surface. They've been placed in the circle in order to engineer the probability distribution of the electrons in the center. We can look at the images of atoms on the surface of solids, like here in silicon. We can trap ions, and those are individual ions, and look at how they're moving together in unison in an ion trap. In the global positioning system, we use atomic clocks to tell us exactly where we are on the surface of the Earth. Humankind's biggest engineering marvel, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, can measure distances to one part in 10 to the 20, allowing us to observe gravitational waves. This is the second quantum revolution. Here we observe and control individual quanta like atoms, photons, and electrons. It's led to a new field of science called quantum information science that is based on three pillars of quantum computing, quantum communication, and quantum sensing. Here we're going to be focusing primarily on the third pillar of quantum sensing. This is not 1920s quantum mechanics. It's not 1970s quantum mechanics. It isn't even 2020s quantum mechanics. This is new. This is quantum operator mechanics. In the class, we're going to focus on the concepts first. We're then going to develop the formalism, and then we're going to relate it to experiment. Your prerequisites are officially freshman physics, modern physics, and a math methods course. But really, if you've taken a good calculus sequence and a math methods course, you should be fine. Come and join the fun and prepare yourself for the second quantum revolution. Okay, so um, I just want to point out that um, many of the things that I'm talking about really don't require the calculus, but because this was a class that was being taught to juniors who have had all of those prerequisites, I did freely use that. And I'm going to um, you know, discuss a little bit more about that in, in this talk itself. So I'm going to really start here with this question of what are the prerequisites that you really need to teach quantum mechanics to prepare a quantum enabled workforce? And there's a fallacy that I think we all live in because most courses use the coordinate representation for wave functions and the differential equation form of the Schrodinger equation. And you might think that that's what you need. That's the way that you do it. But the answer is actually no, you don't. It can actually all be done with much lower level math and physics uh, prerequisites. The math preparation that you really need is high school level algebra and high school level trigonometry. And I'll have a lot more to talk about this um, throughout the talk itself to show you some of those different uh, um, elements and some of the additional math that you will need, but that you can develop by uh, knowing these two topics. You need to know them well, but you really just need to know those two topics. For physics, in the standard way that it's taught, we, ex we would like people to know what Hamiltonians are and things like that. But in my opinion, this is really all that you need to know. You need to know what a vector is and how to work with a vector. You need to know what momentum, energy, and angular momentum are. You need to know what simple harmonic motion is. You need to know Coulomb's law. You need to know that magnets have um, you know, north poles and south poles, and the opposites attract, and it's an inverse square law and things like that. Um, you also need to know that total energy is composed out of uh, potential energy plus kinetic energy. And pretty much that's all that I think you need to know as a background to be able to, to work in quantum mechanics. All right, so I'm going to use strategies that are, are brought from physics education research. And the main thing that I do is I start off the course with conceptual ideas because quantum mechanics is non intuitive and it's subject to many common misconceptions. And 
I spend the first month of the class teaching conceptual ideas. I do that entire four week edX quantum mechanics for everyone class with the students, with the juniors at Georgetown. I then integrate the theoretical ideas with experimental ideas. And one of the things that I really emphasize is to teach the experimental ideas and the experiments related to quantum mechanics because we are physicists, not mathematicians, and we should be focusing on the experimental ideas and relating this to real world experiences of quantum mechanics. So I'm gonna now go through and tell you about the four different quarters of the course, um, which is sort of the main uh, subject areas, the main things that are done. As I mentioned before, the first quarter of the course, which is almost a month, focuses on superposition and entanglement. And I also introduced Dirac notation and the Pauli spin matrices because the main topics that we use to talk about the conceptual ideas of quantum mechanics are stern gerlach experiment and uh, two-slit experiment with light. So we follow these ideas from Feynman in his QED book, and this is where we have the quantum theory of light, uh, from Dan Steyer, who does the quantum theory of spin, and from Ed Taylor, who recognized that you can teach the quantum mechanics ideas from these books much more effectively if you provide visualization tools for the students to really appreciate and understand the material. So at the beginning, we start by explaining what magnetic needles are, what current loops are, and what they do when they're placed in a magnetic field. This is actually very complicated classical mechanics and classical electromagnetism stuff. In many of the spins first textbooks, it's just discussed at a page, but I take about a week to talk about it, building up to what the stern gerlach experiment is. And then with that, we can then talk about Wheeler's delayed choice experiments. We can talk about einstein podovsky rosen experiments, the Bell experiments, and also nuclear magnetic resonance. Then we talk about light, and we include uh, the phenomenon of polarization of light. This allows us to talk about partial reflection, single slit diffraction, two slit diffraction, mirrors, lenses, non-demolition experiments, which we call quantum seeing in the dark, Hanbury, Brown, and Twist, and Hangu Mandel. And then we also introduce Dirac notation, spin operators, and Pauli matrices, which allows us to talk about quantum key distribution and uh, Rabi oscillations. <coughs> Excuse me. So throughout all of this material, we have about 50 interactive tutorials and animations that illustrate the phenomena. This is an illustration of the quantum stern gerlach experiment. And we're illustrating the atom with a solid sphere when we did the classical stern gerlach experiment, we actually illustrated it with a current loop. But here, because we can't see it, we're illustrating it with a sphere that we don't really know what its inner structure is. There's no sound on this because it's just a movie of the animation itself. This is an interactive animation. I haven't shown the buttons and things, but you push buttons and there's text that goes along with this as well. And so this is showing you that when you run the experiment with a quantum system, you get two results. You don't get a continuum where it's split into all possible projections of the magnetic moment. And now when we rotate the experiment by 90 degrees, we find we still get just two. And then, you know, there's a lot more that goes into this. I'm just giving you a little, little glimpse of what these uh, tutorials are like. Um, for those of you that want to understand a little bit about the technical details, these tutorials are written in JavaScript and they run natively on everyone's device uh, with code that is downloaded from the web when they're um, interacting with a particular website. They don't have to download everything. It's all happens behind the scene through the web browser. And this is another one. This is one on light. Here we're looking at wave particle duality. It might be a little bit hard to see, but there are actually little dots that are appearing here at these different locations, indicating the individual photons hitting. And now we're showing what happens when a lot of photons hit. This is what you get when the upper slit is open. And then we're going to show you what happens when the lower slit is open. And you can see here the text box is down in the bottom here, which has uh, instructions. And now we're showing what happens when you have the two slits open. And then at the end, we do a comparison of the three so that you can get a sense of what the wave particle duality is. And again, the actual tutorial is a much longer involved exercise. I'm just giving you some highlights of it. 
All right, in the second quarter of the course, this is actually where we do all of our formalism, but it's not formalism that's teaching you how to solve differential equations. We develop four fundamental operator identities, and I'll have a slide that shows you exactly what these all are if, you've not, if you're not familiar with them. They're the Leibniz rule, the Hadamard lemma, the exponential disentangling identity, and the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff identity. And uh, pretty much because this is doing formal stuff, we really don't talk about any new experiments. We do actually go back and talk about all of the conceptual experiments. We redo them using Dirac notation and Dirac formalism during this quarter. Uh, we also solve for position and momentum eigenstates, and we give, as I said, these more formal descriptions of the stern gerlach and two-slit experiments. Then in the third quarter, this is where we really do the meat of a standard um, quantum mechanics course, we use the Schrodinger factorization method. And many of you might have no idea what the Schrodinger factorization method is. What it is, is it's a generalization of the operator method for solving the simple harmonic oscillator to solve all of the other problems that can be solved analytically. And I don't know why we don't teach this, but it allows you to actually get the eigenvalues without having eigenfunctions just like you can get the eigenvalues of the simple harmonic oscillator without the wave functions. But you also can use these techniques to get wave functions. And I'll have more to say about that a little bit later. So here we talk about simple harmonic oscillator and we include both coherent and squeeze states. And we talk about the einstein podolsky rosen experiment and an incredibly important experiment, time of flight, which allows you to talk about uncertainty principle and other things like that, just to give you sort of a hint of what's going on. Time of flight has a clock that starts at a particular time and then it stops when you detect the particle at some location. And since you know the distance between where the particle or where the event started and where you detected it, and you measured the time, you can get the velocity of the particle. And hence, at that moment, you actually know both the position of the particle, because you detected it in your detector, but you also know its momentum. It doesn't violate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but it actually allows you to actually talk about what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle really means. So it's a really good experiment to talk about in a quantum class. We talk about angular momentum and we do use the Morse potential, which can be solved exactly with these factorization methods. And with that, we talk about molecular rotational spectra. We then talk about hydrogen and we do the hydrogen spectra, but we also talk about the Pickering-Fowler lines, which are these lines that look like hydrogen lines found in uh, the spectra of stars that turn out to be uh, singly ionized helium lines. We talk about how you can measure light and from that discover the deuteron, how you can measure actually the charge radius of the proton just by measuring light, and how you can image the wave function in momentum space using a technique called E2E spectroscopy. And then we also talk, do include perturbation theory to talk about hyperfine transitions, mainly so we can talk about radio astronomy and also to talk about precision experiments and atomic clocks. And then in the final quarter of the course, I do time evolution and second quantization. And this is a one semester course, and I'm not kidding. You guys can teach second quantization to students if you want to teach them about light. So we do time evolution. We do this with the Trotter formula. And with that, we talk about NMR spectroscopy and MRI. And then we quantize light, talk about how you detect single photons. We talk about heterodyne and homodyne detection. We talk about what single photon sources are. And then we end with a discussion about how LIGO works, which again, I think is something that anyone who studies quantum mechanics should know how LIGO, how LIGO works. So in this way that I teach the quantum mechanics, I don't teach Frobenius's method. I don't introduce delta functions. I don't work with second order differential equations. I do work with wave functions, but not from second order differential equations. This is a... Um, uh, word cloud that is showing all of the different experiments that I can cover in this class. And there's really quite a few of them. And I think it's important to bring the physics into a quantum mechanics course, because after all, we are physicists, not mathematicians. So I want to get into a deeper dive in some of the math needs. So one of the things that we need to work with this uh, technique is we need people to know what the power series of an exponential is. It turns out you can get that simply by um, using this fundamental property of the exponential and the binomial theorem. Those two things allow you to get the, and algebra, allow you to get the power series of the exponential function. 
for eigenvectors and eigenvalues, most of, nearly every eigenvalue and eigenvector that I do in the class with matrices is from two by two matrices. And to work with two by two matrices, you can do everything with the quadratic equation. So again, if they have the high school algebra and they know the quadratic equation, they know all that they need in order to work with the matrices. For linear algebra, <coughs> we do have to teach matrix multiplication and matrix vector multiplication, but that's not really very difficult to teach a student. Um, you have to teach them about complex numbers, even if it's supposed to be covered in high school, and I even think some high schools don't cover it anymore. Most students don't feel comfortable with complex numbers, so you have to teach them a bit about complex arithmetic and uh, polar coordinates. Um, and you know, with trigonometry, the expectation is that they know some trigonometry, but often they don't really think about trigonometry in terms of its expressions written by exponentials. And it's actually important to have that in your bag of tricks. So um, this is something that I will review with people. And then uh, hyperbolic functions, which also come in, are easy to teach from the exponential definitions, especially if you've gone over it with the trig functions in this fashion. And that's really all the high level math that is needed. Um, the four operator identities. So the Leibniz rule is the product rule for commutators. The commutator of the product of a b with c is a times the commutator of b with c plus a commutator with c times b in this order and you can just prove that algebraically the next one is the hadamard lemma which is a similarity transformation of operator b with this operator e to the a and it's an infinite power series expansion of nested commutators this you can prove algebraically by induction the next one is an exponential disentangling identity. This is an identity most people don't know, um, unless you work in quantum optics, where it's pretty uh, common there. But even there, many quantum optics textbooks just state the answer. They don't show you how to do it. It says if you take the exponential of something like a sigma y, you can rewrite it in terms of the product of an exponential of a sigma minus, an exponential of a sigma z, and an exponential of a sigma plus with these coefficients in front. And you can prove this just by multiplying and factoring two by two matrices. It's a very simple proof. Uh, once you know how to relate the exponential of a Pauli matrix to Pauli matrices themselves, which is why we need the power series expansion of an exponential in order to do that. And then the final one is Baker Campbell Hausdorff. We really only need it in the so called vial form where the commutator of A with B commutes with everything. And this is actually fairly straightforward to prove algebraically using the binomial theorem and induction. So you can actually prove all of the identities that we need to use um, all algebraically. Um, now, as I'd mentioned, the undergraduate junior level calculus based course is already on edX. It started August 15th. If anyone wants to, um, you can enroll in it. It's free to enroll and to audit the course. You have to pay a fee if you want to see the problem sets. But if any of you are interested in seeing these materials without fees, you can contact me and I can give you access to an earlier version of the course um, where you can see all of the content. So you just send me an email and I can set you up. Um, as I'd mentioned before, we have a pending proposal with NSF to develop an algebra only version. Um, and it's not going to use all of the materials in that junior level course. Um, and hopefully it will uh, be something that will work for these photonics technicians, but also for other people as well, because I think there are many variants along these ideas that can be used uh, to teach people quite a bit of quantum mechanics, but without having a significant uh, math barrier to the entry into the quantum mechanics field. And then I'm going to just end by uh, acknowledging people who have worked with me. Um, the computer animations, uh, were done by two undergraduates, Dylan Cutler and Lucas Vieira Barbosa. Um, an interesting story, I was working with, Luke, uh, with uh, Dylan and we came across a uh, gift stack on Wikipedia that was showing some things about the two-slit experiment that was kind of like the animations that we wanted to use. And literally two days later, this guy walks into my office, an exchange student from Brazil, who happened to be the guy who put that image on Wikipedia and asked if he could work on the project. And so he was, uh, he had 10 years of JavaScript uh, programming experience and was going back to college. And so the two of them worked on these JavaScript uh, animations. 
um, as their senior thesis. Um, and then Pia Batia and Daphne Maniatis, uh, they're two undergraduates who helped me with setting up this long course, both serving as kind of test undergrad, undergraduate test subjects for the material, um, and also just helping with the labor and putting it onto edX. And then Anna Cruz is a member of this unit called Candles, which is the Center for New Design and Learn, New Design and Learning and Scholarship at Georgetown, that works with innovation in teaching. And then this is my email. So um, that's all that I have. Um, I guess I should just stop sharing right now, and I can always come back if there's something you'd like me to show again. But this is uh, the material that I prepared, which I intentionally took only about half an hour to talk about, just so we can have a more thorough discussion uh, about these ideas. Uh, I see. Gloria, did you have your hand up? No, I was clapping. Oh, clapping. <laughs> yeah. I, I mistake all of these things. I saw that there was a uh, in, uh, quantum mechanics for everyone on the side as well. How is that different than what you just described? So the quantum mechanics for everyone is the is the conceptual part. It's that first four weeks. Um, and that I don't do any direct notation or anything like that. It's it's really taught at the level. If you have seen the Feynman QED book and you've seen the Dan Steyer um, quantum mechanics book, it's at that level. It's, it's a college level course taught for non-science majors. And I taught a course very similar to that, which I called the quantum world around us to undergraduates here at Georgetown as a science requirement course for about 10 years. Um, and a lot of these conceptual ideas were also taught in, uh, in that class. Uh, Lincoln, I think you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I had uh, two questions. Hi, Jim. Very nice talk. So, Hi, Lincoln. Yeah, so the first question was, um, have you thought about leveraging the, the FET uh, simulations out of Boulder? Because um, some of them remind me a little bit of some of the things that you're doing, or, or are they just not very effective for what you want to teach? Or, Well, I, I am not a big fan of the FET. I know that FET reaches millions of people, but they're, they're, too, they're, they're too high school for me. Okay. I mean, I don't want to offend anyone from FET, but I mean, I think that's really the audience that they're primarily set up for. And, um, you know, I, so I, I have not found them to be particularly effective. Um, you should take a look at the stuff that I have. I think the graphics we use is much better than, than what they use. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll do that. I there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff you can do um, within JavaScript and the JavaScript libraries that's much more sophisticated than the kinds of things that FET does. Okay, and then is it okay to ask my second question or would you like me to go later? Um, but I can, I just would put one comment on, um, we were inspired by some of the FET demonstrations with some of the videos, uh, some of the animations that we did. So, I mean, FET is a very valuable resource, but I think um, for the specific purposes that we had, that didn't really fit. So um, Thomas, would you like me to ask my yeah, second go, question? Go here? ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So my second question was just about um, quantum sensing. So I know you have an emphasis on quantum sensing, which I think is great, and it's you know like an underserved topic, especially by physicists right now um, outside of optics. Um, and so, I, but I was wondering about NV centers and uh, you know how you how you would incorporate them or what your decisions. All right. Are so for. yeah. So I, I want to make two things clear. So first off, I didn't actually start off trying to create a course for quantum sensing. I started off trying to create a course that included a lot of experiments in physics, because I really didn't like quantum mechanics where you're spending half the semester teaching math and not doing it very well and having the students confused and so forth. So I wanted to avoid that. And I just included a lot of experiments into it. And after I finished, and I really wanted to get to LIGO, I wanted to teach something about LIGO. And after I finished that, I recognized that a lot of the stuff that I've done is really relevant for sensing. So the way I describe this class is actually, this is the quantum mechanics for sensing. It is not a quantum sensing class. It really needs a follow-up class after this in quantum sensing to teach mm -hmm. the full stuff. But I think after this one semester class, you're ready to take that kind of a advanced quantum sensing class that would do things like talk about 
Um, I only talk about photo detectors for single particle, you know, single photon detectors. There's like four or five other kinds of single photon detectors. You'd want to talk about that. I don't talk about NV centers. I don't talk about, um, you know, a lot of this. I don't talk about in the real details of non-demolition experiments. I don't talk about cavity QED and things like that. That's all stuff yeah. that would be in a course that would follow this this one. Okay, thanks. Uh, for Ruzan? Hello. Um, I have a, a question uh, in terms of um, your simula simulations. Are they available for our students too? I understand if we uh, go to a course we can use it, but where are they shared if we can? Okay, so there, there are two places that you can get to, get to them. One of them is uh, we have them on GitHub. So if you search quantum mechanics for everyone in GitHub, you can just download them. And it's the whole code and everything like that. Um, I have made a couple I've made a couple of you know minor changes of wording in some of them that I haven't re-uploaded to GitHub. So they're a little bit of an older version, but everything you need to run them is there. Um, but I'm gonna let me just get this website and then I'll type it in the chat. Um, And I'm going to actually go there. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. And I'm going to just go there. I'm going to have to sign in. Um, so this is a site that I've set up that talks about all of the work I'm doing on quantum mechanics. And under courses, I have a site for quantum mechanics for everyone. And you can actually click on one of the um, um, one of the tutorials. So this is the first Stern Gerlach tutorial. And you know it has a text box here. And you know it has visuals. This is our source. And you, know, you interact with the tutorial. And then um, it's got an animate. Whoops, I did that too fast. So these are the current loops that come out. And uh, then we're going to set it up in such a way that we're going to put it through the magnet. This is the magnet. We draw the lines of force, and then uh, we go and see what happens when we put them through. And um, you know, I I could never make something like what the these guys did. They just did a spectacular job, as you can see. You know, so it's showing how the precession rate is changing as you get into a higher magnetic field. Um, you know, this is a close up that is showing. You know precisely how this motion works. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that's available, but you can actually get all of this right off that quantum uh, domains Georgetown site. Uh, you can just have them run it here if they want to, um, or uh, you can download them from the GitHub and uh, you can embed them in your own websites and, and use them that way. They need to be embedded in a website via an iframe. Um, I hope we put the instructions for how to do that in the GitHub. Um, but someone who knows how to work with JavaScript, I actually don't know the details of how it works, but someone who knows how to do that. Um, so I'm not going to go through the, the whole tutorial. I'll stop sharing here. But that gives you a sense of it. So all of the videos from the class and all of the tutorials are accessible just by clicking on them on this website. And I have two other courses here as well. Um, so the course for the undergraduates, all of the videos are available here for that. Um, I actually, this isn't relevant for you guys, but I have a graduate level course that I have videos for, you know, courtesy of COVID-19, I had to record the videos for all of those. And then I also have a math methods class on edX and, you know, all the materials for all of that is available on this, on this site. So, uh, you know, feel free to go there and, and use any of those materials that you that you find useful. Thank you. Uh, Mo, put your hand up. Hey, hello, everyone. This is Mo Hassanovic from Indiana River State College. This is my first contact with this group. 
Professor Fuchs was enough to invite me to the group. So maybe just a little bit of a feedback, you know, from someone who uh, took Professor Friedrich CDX course. Uh, so I'm please, coming Please from... call me Jim. Please do not call me Professor Friedrichs. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm coming from the electrical engineering background. I'm not coming from physics. And uh, over the last five years, I'm teaching photonics courses as well as electronics courses at Liberty River State College, which actually is a two-year community college. We have a national center for lasers and fiber optics education. So we are pretty much focusing on the optics side. Uh, so throughout my uh, educational career, I was always afraid or I was maybe not interested in a quantum mechanic mechanics because it was always kind of too theoretical for me. And then we had this whole big you know, revolution that's uh, taking place over the last 10 years. And I really would like to thank Jim for this course. You know, I actually took that course and you know, that course was really very inspirational for me. It brought the quantum mechanics closer to the field. And you know, he was actually instrumental in me kind of going back and in going uh, into that whole field. Uh, we have been discussing, you know, this whole quantum uh, aspect of the of the photonics for, you know, probably, you know, few um, last few years, and that's basically what, you know, turned into this uh, 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 proposal that we put that's been awarded a few months ago. It's going to be a three-year project, so I'm inviting anyone who wants to, you know, collaborate and work together, you know, on on what we are doing. Uh, so, so we are kind of approaching it from a little, little different perspective. You know, we are, we are focusing on the photonic side, especially. And uh, being a community college, you know, we are very kind of focused on the industry. So uh, we're going to go through a few steps as to, you know, what we're going to be doing. First one, actually uh, doing a survey of the industry and seeing, you know, what really, what kind of skills and competencies the quantum industry needs in, a, in a, this whole uh, skilled workforce type of, uh, you know, um, a, um, and, uh, environment, and you know there have been already some uh, some surveys and some research and some papers that have been published that are kind of interesting to read. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of there's a lot of publications that are saying that the seed of the new quantum workforce is actually in photonics. So those guys who are doing who are playing with the lasers and you know fiber optic cables and laser alignment and all that kind of stuff would be upskilled. Uh, to the to the level of of, of, of of that future quantum technician, and these types of efforts, like uh, you know what Jim does, is definitely helping a lot. So one is you know we have to definitely uh, make sure you know that what we are doing you know in any kind of uh, uh, course offerings on the community colleges that that's kind of aligned with the industry you know because we want to give the knowledge and skills that is needed by the industry. Number one and number two, which is also very important, is is a hands-on, you know, these guys, the technicians, you know, they, they, you know, they, they won't be asked that much, you know, to, uh, to do any kind of design you know, in a quantum uh, world, they will be asked to uh, do a lot of hands-on. And that's another thing that uh, Jim actually helped me, you know, get in touch with Professor Galvez from Colgate University, who is uh, doing a lot of hands-on. If, so if you're not just interested in, in, a, in, a, in a simulations like these that, uh, that are definitely extremely, extremely helpful, but also you would want to put something, you know, like a lab, you know, there is certain hubs, you know, across the country that are doing, you know, the hands-on stuff. We just actually, Professor Galvez was, uh, you know, visiting Indian River last week, you know, we spent the entire week to set up the lab and, you know, put like a entanglement experiment and single quantum interference with, a, you know, a low noise uh, uh, counting detectors, et cetera, et cetera. So those are just the things that, you know, I would like to share right now if you guys have any questions, you know, as you know, for someone who is also in this field, you know, I'll be more than happy to help you. And again, you know, thanks a lot, Jim, for, you know, this is, this is actually, as I said, the first, you know, I put my feet and make my feet wet, made my feet wet with your course that helped me yeah. kind of be encouraged more to read Feynman book and, uh, you know, some of, it, of these other books that are out there. There, there's, there is a textbook that really emphasizes doing things exactly that way. Um, I'm not enamored with the whole text, but it actually talks about all of these ex these kinds of experiments. It's by uh, Beck. Correct. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he has a, he has a textbook, and he has like a whole appendix of like ten experiments that you can do to 
illustrate wave particle duality, single photon interference, and, and things like that. You know, I, I think these things are not cheap. Uh, I, I was just refereeing a paper for American Journal of Physics where this guy was saying, you know, I have a great wave particle duality experiment that's, you know, cheap compared to the other ways that it could be done. And in the end, you know, the experimental apparatus for this one experiment was like 25K. I'm saying you and I have a different opinion of what is cheap experimental apparatus. Mm -hmm. But um, so, so some of these sort of single particle experiment things really require some kind of, you know, significant setup. You're probably looking at 30, 40 K and some dedicated space in order to, to be able to do it. But it's the kind of a thing that can be done, um, you know, once you have the setup and the equipment is working, you know, you have it. So I don't know that the maintenance costs are incredibly high, um, but it certainly is something that would, uh, would require some significant investment by someone in order to, to carry that out. On the other hand, there are, if you look up delayed choice two slit experiment on the web, you can find people that take a laser pointer, a piece of paper, a pin and uh, 3D movie go goggles, glasses, and they construct a delayed choice two slit quantum experiment for about 10 bucks. So um, you can do some of these experiments cheaply if you want to. There's another aspect uh, that that we will be doing, and that's uh, uh, that actually Professor Gaudi has already developed. You know, he put it together, which is a remote access to the lab. So you don't, if you want to do the hands-on, you know, it doesn't mean we actually just spent 10, uh, around twenty thousand dollars to you know to, to buy these detectors and everything. But you can put like different types of motorized types of you know structures that can be remotely controlled, and you can gain access to the lab. So that's just another approach, you know, that can definitely be, you know, used, uh, you know, as a means of collaboration you know, in the future for this. Uh, I think Karim, you have your hand up and you're next. Uh, yeah, so I was um, also interested in um, ways of uh, disseminating this as much as possible, but in a slightly different context, because I'm also in a community college, but I don't have technicians. All the students that I have are actually planning to transfer into an engineering program. Most of them want to go to UF and sometimes they go to other places. And so for me, that, that situation would be a little different because it's not going to be a hands-on practical training for them or related to any kind of industry because they're not heading there yet. Uh, and yet when I look at their majors, many of them are going into all types of engineering. But, uh, and also we have restrictions on how many credits they can, they can take and how transferable those credits are. And so I was wondering in terms of disseminating this, is this something that you would share in terms of the content with the lectures, the papers, or what, what do you have in mind in, in order to make this spread further? In, in all these different contexts, one where it would be more applied hands-on and one where it would be more of a sort of general knowledge and not, not necessarily for a, a major. This is directed to Mo, not me, right? Uh, either, you, either of you, actually. Yeah, so I mean, I, I would say for, for me, um, um, you know, we might have to talk with some administrators at Georgetown you know, I'm perfectly happy having anyone use my materials, mm -hmm. you know, for educational purposes, you're, you're free to use them. Um, if you have the ability to run, so the, the class is coded in the edX platform and it's not really translatable mm -hmm. as a class. So the full class with the grading of the exercises and things like that, that's all done within the edX platform. That's not easily uh, translated if you can't run edX, but edX runs, a uh, um, open source platform called Open edX mm -hmm. that allows you to run an edX server and the course can be translated uh, to someone who's running that edX server. I have been told it's not that easy to run the edX server. So yep. it, that might not be that simple of an option, but there's, yeah, we, also, we also have all of our animations are available via the GitHub they're also available via this website. All of the videos are on YouTube 
or available from the website. It, it turns out I don't have access to the YouTube videos for the quantum mechanics for everyone class. I'm trying to get it, but I don't have it yet. So, um, so, what so I you... don't have that on my YouTube channel, but all of my other videos are on my YouTube channel. So how, would it, how easy would it be to kind of reproduce a version of your course locally, uh, even if we don't have the edX platform, for instance? It would be a fair amount of work because there's a lot of text that text and images that go along with the video. I mean, you'd have to take a look at it. Okay. Um, there's a lot of text and images that go along with the video. And I don't think there's any easy way of exporting that where it would be workable to just put it up as web pages. Of course, one can go in and copy and paste and stuff, but that's that's a very long and tedious exercise, unfortunately. Okay. Um, However, if you want to use the animations and things like that, that just requires embedding them into a website. They could probably be embedded in Canvas, although I haven't tried to do that. Yeah, that can be done. Um, but they probably can be in embedded within there. And um, you know, the thing that edX has that's very nice about their platform is yeah. when you answer questions, they don't have to be just multiple choice. You can actually enter formulas and the formulas get graded. So it's a much richer experience for the people who are who are taking the class. And it's one of the things that I like about the edX platform is that you have this uh, this capacity and uh, the people at MIT wrote a very advanced grader that goes on top of the edX uh, platform that allows you to do very complicated things like you can forbid someone for from putting in some particular function or some particular combination of letters because you want them to work it out a different way and you don't want them to put that in as an answer and things like that. So it really allows you to control the experience of how people will enter answers. Um, and then what's so nice about it is they get immediate feedback. They know whether they're right or wrong immediately. And if they're wrong, they get, a, you know, they get extra chances to be right. Um, so those those are some aspects that are, I think are very nice about the edX platform. There are other aspects about edX that are not so nice. Um, I don't think their servers are powerful enough, so you run into issues with timeout delays and things like this. And I, um, they do weird things like they've changed the format of their page, which makes some of my stuff not work immediately, and you have to click a button to get it to format properly and work and so forth. So they have some aspects that are less than pleasant. As far as I'm concerned, the, just to kind of clarify, so the, the project that I'm working on that's been already funded by NSF is a three year and the goal is to develop three course curriculum in quantum. Uh, so one course would be, again, if, I'm, I'm going from the, you know, from the uh, aspect of the photonics. So the first course would be just teaching about the optical components, you know, like cryogenics and uh, lasers and the down conversion crystals, anything that uh, a quantum technician would be, would, would see in the lab. So that would be the first course. And then the second course would be the course on the spectroscopy with a focus on the Raman. There's certain quantum, there's certain quantum aspects there. Uh, and then the third course is a course that would be kind of similar. So there's a lot of overlap, you know, that's something that, you know, that I'm hoping that, uh, that we're gonna closely co collaborate with, uh, you know, Jim's team, which would be this introduction to quantum similar to what he is doing here. Uh, the purpose of that course, you know, from the perspective of photonics industry is to, uh, to raise the quantum awareness. A lot of these concepts that we are talking about uh, uh, that are, you know, pure quantum, they're not really needed by the technician uh, but they need to know the terminology. They, they are not going to be designing, you know, some, you know, quantum system or atomic clock or whatever. They'll be working in the lab with a PhD guy or a guy or engineer who is, you know, who is a physics, PhD physics students, etc. But they have to know the terminology and they have to know, you know, so it's kind of more uh, raising awareness about the quantum, you know, in, a, in, 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 a, in, in, in that whole technician uh, field. Now, the part of the funding, as I said, is three course curriculum. Since it's an NSF project, it's going to be open access. And uh, the goal is to be fully open access on, a, on an alternative platform. We have not decided yet, but it's gonna be open to all community colleges 
Is it going to be edX or Blackboard or Canvas? I'm not sure at this point yet, but the goal is not only to develop the, the educational materials such as textbooks and lab books, but also have like videos and, uh, you know, um, it is going, the, the courses that we are planning to develop uh, would be fully um, uh, certified by the quality matters. I'm not sure if you heard of quality matters, that's another standardization for the online teaching. You know, so it's kind of a little larger undertaking. Uh, so everyone would have, a, you know, I would, for, for example, need some of, you know, community colleges to just uh, test the whole curriculum and see, you know, how it works with the students. You know, I also have some funding for that. So it's kind of a little larger undertaking. And as I said, stay tuned. If you're interested, you know, I can definitely share some information with you, you know, some like brief presentations, overviews of the project, if you're interested to take part in it. And this, you know, in a sense, if I kind of look a long term, as this quantum industry evolves, you know, we are in a, you know, community college, uh, I mean, uh, two year education. The plan is even, you know, to move in the direction of a national center for quantum technologies three to five years from now. And in order to put that type of a proposal, you know, I would need some sort of, a, you know, partners among the community colleges, you know, that can work because that, that definitely increases the chances of, you know, getting the, you know, a multi million dollar type of award by the NSF to, uh, you know, to move further, you know, into this whole uh, field. So if anyone is interested, you know, let me know. And as I said, you know, I think we have a lot of uh, opportunities here to collaborate, work together and, you know, not to uh, double the work or, you know, um, so I think that's- And, and I want to point one, one thing out that, that, you know, Mo conveyed to me was his students, the highest math they take is the college algebra. You know, so they don't have any any calculus, anything like that. So if they're going to learn any quantum, it has to be done in a way that doesn't require derivatives or other things like that. Exactly. And that goes back to Karim's question. Uh, anything that we are, I mean, the program that I teach in two years is not transferable to a four-year four -year degree institution. If I teach DC or AC circuits, those courses are algebra based. They are heavily focused on multimeters and how to measure the voltage and the current. We are not going into the whole aspect of a calculus. So you cannot, so it's nothing is transferable. So if you're looking for something that's more, you know, pre-engineering and transferable, it would have to be calculus based. Probably this course that, that Jim, Jim just opened on edX, if I understood correctly, that's calculus based. And there's also another course that Jim is offering that I took, which was algebra based. So just kind of draw a distinction between those two. Uh, Magda, I think you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to ask uh, to what extent students need to know fiber optics, the basics and its practical application in, in those kinds of experiments. Or quantum. I don't know if this question I'm, is more to James I'm, or to I'm going to defer to Mo because I'm not an experimentalist. So, uh, <clears throat> so we have a full scale course. As I said again, our program is in electronics engineering technology, and we have a heavy focus on photonics and uh, robotics. And in the photonics, we teach four courses: one introduction to photonics, where they uh, teach about where they learn about light and you know, wave theory, dual theory, and those kinds of things, reflection, refraction, diffraction. And then second course is a, a ray optics or geometrical optics. Third course is a fiber optics where they learn all about fusion splicing and that. And then we have four course, which is the laser technologies where they learn about high power lasers. Now, going back to your question, you know, some of the experiments that we put together in the lab that are in a quantum domain, uh, on the back where you are trying to capture these single photons and you know these so-called coincidences uh, we are talking about the detectors that are uh, based on uh, avalanche diodes and then in the back of the detector is a fiber optic cable that connects to you know some sort of data processing uh, small board and the computer that's gonna you know show some plots or whatever so there is a certain aspect of the fiber optics but it's it's on a basic level right so that would be my quick answer to your question. Yeah, my, my sense would be that uh, it well, many of these experiments probably use fiber optics, but they're not critical for understanding how the experiment works. So you don't actually need to know how the fiber optics works, just like I can use a laser pointer without knowing how a laser works. 
and it's perfectly fine. So my guess is that, you know, if if you want to go down that road and teach them about that, that's perfectly fine. It'll be an example for them, but it's not a requirement to be able to do the experiments. Exactly. Another another aspect to be mentioned is um, there are certain re there is certain research that uh, uh, they are they they are researching these quantum phenomena on something called integrated photonics. There's a few themes, so they're making these integrated photonics types of chips. Integrated photonics is kind of like planar, planar version of the of the optical fiber, right? So they're you're not using a fiber optic cable, but rather putting optical waveguides on a on a silicon chip. And there's a few teams, uh, you know, across the nation that are doing that type of research. So that may, you know, turn into some sort of mass-produced type of a chip, you know, into which you know. Uh, Five uh, integrated photonics chips will be used as a platform, you know, perform some of these, uh, you know, quantum phenomena. Uh, Gloria, thank you. Got your hand up. Hi, uh, I think this question is more for James, and it's sort of a follow up to Kareem's question, and that is that uh, in a lot of tier colleges, or at least, um, at least where I teach. Uh, quantum mechanics is part of our intro course so we have three semesters for our intro course so we actually have plenty of time to dedicate to quantum so would you say a subset of your materials would be appropriate for court for that course or are they really meant to be for a whole semester, well, well whole certainly semester the, long? The, the the conceptual ideas stuff which is about a month long it's pretty standalone so that could be taught you know, without without doing anything else, you know, it, it's it's about it's four weeks worth of material, four maybe five weeks worth of material, and and that for sure could be taught without any uh, uh, without requiring anything else. Thank you. Well, I don't see anybody else with a hand. I'll ask a, a question. It is two o'clock about uh, Pacific time where, where I'm at or five, if, if you need to drop out, but I'm happy to stick around. I do have a question uh, for Jim. Do you, th uh, do you think there's a space for this to, to be turned into sort of a, a, a general science for non-scientists course, given the tack of technology? Well, again, I mean, that was actually the origin of, of when I started working on this was that I was teaching quantum mechanics for non-scientists. Essentially, what we were doing was we taught um, the first part of Steyer's book, the first two or three chapters of QED. And because I'm a condensed matter theorist, we then taught solid state physics. So we taught them about um, lasers. We taught about Bose-Einstein condensation. We talked about semiconductors and metals and insulators. We talked about superconductivity and so forth. And for that latter set of materials, we used Scientific American articles. And I hadn't really thought much about it, but many of these Scientific American articles, which are really good articles, they were written in the 50s and 60s. And the students were kind of like, you know, we want to learn about what's happening today, not what happened so long ago. And they were actually turned off by that material because it was too old. You know, the the articles were too old, um, which was kind of a surprising response. I was not expecting that that kind of a, a response from them. And I was originally planning on trying to do a longer one semester long kind of uh, quantum mechanics. <coughs> very similar to that course, but trying to update it. Um, but I didn't get enough funding from Georgetown to do that. They wanted a short course. So I did the four week course. And um, it was only after I finished that course that the students said, well, this was great. What what's next? And I'm like, guys, it took me three years to do the four week course. There isn't anything next. Um, but I thought about it some more, and I and I learned some things I didn't know about quantum mechanics, such as this factorization method. I learned that you can actually do a lot of the curriculum algebraically, and um, 
I've been actually engaged in research trying to figure out more and more things that can be done algebraically. I'm currently working on a on two projects. One of them is uh, calculating the spreading of a free Gaussian wave packet purely algebraically. And another one is uh, using 3D uh, visualizations to properly understand what wave particle duality means at the sort of wave function level, um, which I think is a concept that's really poorly taught. Um, I think it's well taught for par wave particle duality for a two slit experiment, but when you think about it in terms of wave particle duality of a wave function, I think it's really not done very well. Um, so those are some projects. So I've actually, I've probably written a dozen papers in the last couple of years on things related to this, which is primarily developing new ways of doing things algebraically that had previously been done with differential equations. Um, and there's still more to do. We're not finished with this. So that's why this project is dragging on for me a lot longer than I had thought it would. I was hoping that, you know, writing this book would be, you know, a two, three year venture, but I've been at it now, I think, for three or four years. And I'm right now I'm just typesetting the second chapter. So um, there's there's been a lot of a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, Kareem, you have another? Uh, yes, I have a sort of general question on uh, textbooks in quantum physics. So the traditional version, as you mentioned earlier, was always uh, going through the wave functions and the Schrodinger equation and so on. And I've noticed a lot of more recent books start with the stern gerlach and do the two level system, stuff like that. Do you see a possibility for the, even in the physics programs, for the standard junior level, even grad school uh, quantum physics courses to evolve and also in that direction. I, I'm not sure how it's going on right now, but. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna say something that might make me sound a little bit like a heretic, okay. but I don't really view it as particularly innovative if all you're doing is reordering the topics. Right, okay. But so that's essentially what the SPINS FIRST program is doing. Um, now, when you look at a book like Townsend's book, mm -hmm. um, he doesn't actually go over the classical mechanics for what you would expect, you know, why you would do this for a stern gerlach experiment or this or that. He just sort of writes down in one line, the force is the gradient of the, is proportional to the gradient of the magnetic field. I don't know about you, but I certainly didn't know that if I put a current loop in a magnetic field, it processes and the force on it is the gradient of the magnetic field. I don't know that. I mean, I, I took e &M. I haven't taught e &M, but I don't think that's part of a standard curriculum, even if it's a relatively simple idea. So I think students get lost right from the start. I mean, I haven't done research on this, but I think students can easily get lost right at the start if these topics are introduced too quickly. They need to really understand what's going on. So I kind of view this instead as thinking of it as what happens when you put light through a prism. When you put light through a prism, you separate it into its colors. And you're doing that because you found a way to get the light of different colors to travel at different speeds through the prism. And essentially, the stern gerlach experiment is trying to do the same thing. Um, when you put a current loop in a magnetic field, it processes, but the projection of the current of, you can you know use the right hand rule, you get the effective magnetic needle, like a compass needle for the current loop. The projection of that needle on the magnetic field direction is a constant during the precession. So when you put it in a magnetic field, the, the projection on that magnetic field doesn't change as a function of time. It rotates around, but it doesn't change. And that means that if you can then put it in a non-uniform magnetic field, you can have a force that's proportional to the magnitude of that projection. And then your expectation is it'll separate just like light in a prism. And then when you do the experiment, you find, no, it goes to two dots. Well, that's a big surprise. OK, but even just getting to the point of asking, I like to start off the class by asking people, how do you do an experiment on something that's so small you can't see it? I mean, people should think about this. How do you, how do you even try to do something? I mean, we say atoms exist and so forth. I mean, and now we, we actually have very clever ways that we can even image them. But I mean, back then you didn't. How do you do an experiment on something that you can't even see? 
So, you know, I try to very slowly motivate, you know, how you would do such an experiment. And then, you know, when you get this very crazy result that comes out, you have to try and reconcile that. Well, what could be a possible explanation and how do you get there? So I take a whole week to do what spins first people tend to do in like two pages in a textbook. And I think you need to have that time if you're going to teach it. Otherwise, they're going to be as lost with, with doing it this way as they are with, with any other way of doing it. So it's, it's really important that people understand what it is when they're trying to deal with material that is so confusing. You want to make sure they're grounded every step of the way as much as you can. That's why I do the entire, the exact same curriculum with juniors who are supposed to know this stuff. But they don't. They need to see these conceptual things just as much as anyone else does. So yeah, I think the real key is to make sure you do things slowly so that people can be able to absorb what it is. So you know, one of the things for sure, if I was teaching something like this class in a two-year college, I would chop a lot of material out of it. Because what a junior, you know, at Georgetown can do is not going to be the same as what a first or second year at a two-year college is going to be able to do. This is just, you know, reality of, of the way things are. So, um, so one has to pick and choose what are the topics you want to cover. And it's always better to cover those topics, get them to understand those topics well, than it is to try to cover too many topics and have them not understand anything. This is also a useful tidbit from physics education research. They, they've been telling us that for more than two decades. Well, I think one of the useful things to do is to maybe make it a, a sort of a palatable or an appealing proposition for the two-year colleges to even maybe think that they can learn this stuff. Uh, because right now, that most of them think in mean, the quantum physics, that's for physics majors. I'm not a physics major. I don't need to worry about this. And even though it comes up, even in a two year, in a two semester course, you always run into things that are really fundamentally quantum mechanics, but we yep. don't do it because we, we don't have time. But I think maybe even just playing with some of your simulations might be something I may throw into the course just for those, because you always have like two or three. You know, very often uh, high school do enrollment kids who are super bright who want to, you know, dive into this stuff on their own, just to push them in that direction. Because I, like I announced at the beginning of my semester, one of my learning my course outcome is to turn one of you into a physics major. <laughs> if I can, I fail every well, semester. Well, actually, when I taught when I taught the course for non scientists, we would typically get one major a year. Yeah. Okay. That's from good. the class. That's good. So, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a crazy thing because the ideas, when they finally get the ideas, they're so remarkable. People want to know more. Mm -hmm. They want to learn more. So, um, I mean, the only, the only advice I would give if you want to try to do that, you really have to prep them ahead of time with the material before. So, like, the, the first tutorial I have is after, you know, I don't know, 15 pages of text and videos and things like that. They need to have that material first before uh, jumping into the into the the tutorial. But yeah, I mean, I think it is it's a really good idea because the things that come out and what you can do with them is so remarkably complex and interesting. And I think there's going to be a big push <coughs> to try to get more quantum education into the two year colleges. Now, I don't think it's something that you know NSF doesn't have any stick to make two-year colleges do this. But I think they're going to try to find ways to create programs that will make it easier to do this because there's going to be a push to include more of this in K through 12 as well. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be happening. And it's always better to get in on the ground floor when, some, when change is occurring than, than waiting to the last minute. Yeah, one of the things I run into a lot is students who take the two semesters of physics and are not ready to transfer yet because they haven't finished all their requirements. And they're looking for something else to study. They want to learn more. And because of all these course requirements, we can't offer too many uh, courses. One of the things I've been thinking about is a sort of, uh, uh, in, sort of research type of course project, something that's more open-ended, 
And this could be an interesting thing to offer. Well, I mean, you know, the kind of a thing that, uh, you know, a, a different way that you could do it is, I mean, you could combine something like the course I have with materials that come out of places like IBM on quantum computing, especially if they've had some familiarity with Python. Um, so you could have like, you know, one third of the semester is doing conceptual ideas from quantum mechanics. You could have like a third of the semester doing quantum computing related things. And then for the other third, you could either do something related to quantum communication if you want it to be um, a, uh, you know, a quantum information science kind of course. Um, or you could try to get some hands-on activities and get them involved in doing some stuff in the lab. Even if it's just stuff playing with lasers and things, it doesn't have to be single photon light sources to have them do things that are meaningful. Um, you know, you could construct something like that, which would be a way of getting them involved in the quantum ideas. Yeah, that's something I'll think about. Yeah. But thanks. No, for it's, uh, but I think there's lots of opportunities and there's also lots of materials that are available. It's always though, challenging to figure out how do you actually put them together and use them and I don't really have a great answer for that because you know I invested a ridiculous amount of time putting it into the edX platform if it's possible to run it via edX you know that's that's great and, and one can do it that way um, I have no problem you know running my course as a new version of the course and having it run um, um, you know, having someone else, you know, be the instructor on the course that, that's being run. I don't think I can do 200 versions of that, but I could probably do, you know, one or two. Um, so, I mean, I think there are some opportunities available for, for using the, the platform that, that already exists. Um, but this issue of trying to figure out, because there is no universal course platform and they're all different and figuring out how do you manage and use materials from one into another and things like that uh, there's no easy answer to that and that's that is likely to be the biggest roadblock in trying to make things work well thank you yeah that was great uh I, i'm uh trying to figure out how to block out time to to get through the edX course this semester among my other projects. Um, thanks for giving me one more thing all, to do. <laughs> all I can say is it's well worth your time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm gonna... even, even seasoned even seasoned quantum mechanics people, I think, will learn something new from the yeah, quantum I'm a, mechanics. Experiment. I'm a uh, solid state experimentalist. I did electron spin resonance in graduate school, and then went off to teach stuff but uh I'm i can almost I guarantee you'll you'll see you'll see something new so yeah it's yeah, well uh, i i, 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 I had to learn new of, things just yeah. to do it i had to learn new things i saw those hints of of don't do the wave function as i was getting through my dissertation and i thought i know how to do the wave function even if it's not very practical i'm just going to put that in my dissertation so i can be done right <laughs> but uh i saw those things coming as you know this is 12 years ago working as I was working through that and I thought that boy if, if I were going to be here longer I would I would really need this to progress in the field and and it's nice that there's a resource out there that's cool well it's really remarkable that uh Schrodinger didn't really like the Schrodinger equation he came up with this other way of doing it he, it was about 15 years after he did the Schrodinger equation but he published it in the Proceedings of the Irish Scientific Society or something like the Science Academy, uh, Academy of Sciences Nobody during knew. World War II. So it didn't really get <laughs> noticed by very many people. Um, and those who did notice it, like there's actually a comment about it in David Bohm's book, if you read it very carefully. He says, you know, after he solved like the hydrogen atom, or I think maybe after he did the, he does the harmonic oscillator using the operator method. And then he makes this comment like, well, this can be extended to other problems, but you don't really learn very much more. So I'm going to do it the differential equation way. And, and again, I, I think the reason why we were stuck with the differential equation way was in the 1940s and 50s, physics graduate students knew differential equations and they knew them very well. And quantum mechanics was an advanced graduate 
topic. So they taught it to the strengths of the students. But that's not true anymore. When we teach it to undergraduate students, they are not experts on differential equations. If anything, they absolutely hate differential equations. And yet we're still trying to teach them in a way that was designed for people who are comfortable with differential equations. I just think we should think of other ways of doing it. Um, you don't have to like the way that I do it. You don't have to teach the way that I do it. But I would like you to at least see it and then make a choice yourself as to what you'd like to do rather than uh, just decide you want to cram the differential equations down people's throats because well, yeah, if there's that's really what thing, you're doing. <laughs> if there's one big thing I've learned from being involved with APT and this group of people, it's the it's that the, the, the don't just teach it how you learned it just because that's how you learned it. That's that's the real trap for a lot of particularly beginning yeah. instructors is, well, I learned yeah. it this way and I kind of understand it that way. So I'm just going to present it that way. There, yep. there is like there may very well be a, a better way that helps you understand it better. And even if even if you go through the whole exercise and decide that's not better, at least it's different. Yep. And that may be a value in teaching. Yep, I agree. I agree completely. You were right. I, I found that citation from Boom right there. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's remarkable. Um, it's uh, um, and then the other thing that I found: read Schiff's book and then read Bohm's book. So they they both come from Oppenheimer's course that he developed actually during World War II. Um, they're actually almost word for word the same, except for the one chapter on measurement that Bohm added. Basically, I don't know how he got by with essentially plagiarizing shift because shift's book came out two years earlier um it's essentially a plagiarization of shift's book but it's because they both took the same course and uh um you know there there's there are things that are a little bit different um but it's really that that actually started the trend which you know frankly you take pretty much any quantum mechanics textbook and go through the table of contents and pretty much all the material in one table of contents is exactly the same material in another table of contents. There's essentially no difference. People just are writing new textbooks, but doing the same the same thing. I, I don't really know why. And in fact, a lot of them write in the preface. You might ask why I'm writing a new textbook when you know i'm covering all of the same material and there's all these textbooks available but and then they always end with something like well i think i do it a little bit different and it's beneficial so this is why i'm doing it um and you know they're all the same they're yeah, all as, i mean it was, joe notes it, same thing for intro physics it's oh intro physics is even worse it's, it, it's they, the, they even you copy just, the errors yeah. they copy the errors uh-huh yeah the same erroneous diagrams are in multiple multiple uh textbooks yeah it's uh it's amazing yeah that's why i've drifted away from particularly pay for a text so i can i can take an open source thing and mangle it to my liking <laughs> a little bit and yeah uh, and it's a lot easier the one thing that's a real challenge is in the first few years the students really need some kind of a text it's very very difficult to teach a course without a text to to someone in the first and second year i think they really rely on them so much so yeah it, interestingly uh, my students do not it's like rest it's like wrestling cats to get them to read a textbook well they say that but i think <laughs> but i think that you know when it comes time to study and other things like that they're happy they have a text that they can look at. Um, I, I but I agree with you. It often is hard. Yeah. About fifty percent <laughs> of my students hard to get um, crack a text as the extreme last option. And but that's why I tell them I, I picked a free one so that it shouldn't be a last option. This is you can just go get it. It's just on the internet. It's not hard. Yeah. Well, the but, easiest yeah, way to get them to crack it is is you give them a reading quiz that if they read it, I mean, not anything that really tests the content, but you know, if they read it, they could answer the question like, this chapter discussed which energy, momentum, angular momentum, and they have to check one, you know, a very low stakes thing like that. It's, it's, I always, I always think that, you know, it's, it's crazy to require 
students who are paying for an education to do this, but you know, they're still basically kids, so you have to yep. do it. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording here. Thanks, Jim. That was really, that's really great. Uh, uh, ideas are spinning, but uh, I'm going to stop here. Yeah. I'm happy to hang out and, and let people chat for a while. Uh, well, thanks for having me here. Uh, I am going to have to go very soon because I'm, I'm supposed to go to yet one more meeting. But uh, yeah, if course. there's anything else people want to talk about, happy to stick around a little bit longer.